In January of 1895, the city of Oswego was abuzz with anticipation. With the opening of the Richardson Theatre, the city's thirst for live entertainment could once again be satisfied. The Academy of Music had closed three years earlier, and business tycoon and ex-mayor Max B. Richardson did his part to fill the void. With a seating capacity of 1,500, the Richardson Theatre was decorated and furnished, as well as any theatre found in New York City. It was the pride of Oswego for over 36 years, hosting more than 5,000 events on its stage. By 1930, however, its days as a live theatre venue were over. It was anyone's guess what would replace it. They were known initially as the YMCA Dramatics Club, but by February of 1939, after the adoption of a constitution and bylaws, they were henceforth known as the Oswego Players. The group was led by Ben Rakusa, a handsome young history teacher recently hired by the high school, and Gladys Steenberg, a fellow faculty member with an equal interest in theater. Another important member of the group was Frances Marion Brown, who recently graduated from speech and drama school at Syracuse University. An Oswego native, this woman was so impressive the group decided to give her directorial responsibilities for their first feature play. It was a comedy called The Late Christopher Bean, and it debuted in the spring of 1939. They uh, started putting on professional plays, and they were doing them in the Oswego High School, which is down where the condominiums are, down here on West uh, First Street. And uh, they would uh, put on the show one night. They used to put the show on one night for uh, uh, on Monday nights, and uh, they were able to rent the high school auditorium. That was the high school at that time they would have to uh, get the uh, auditorium ready for the performance over the weekend. Like on Friday night, they would have uh, a, crew, a stage crew come in and they'd build the set and uh, they'd be working on it Friday and Saturday. And then uh, on uh, sometimes on uh, Saturday night and on um, a Sunday night, they would have their dress and technical rehearsals and put the uh, show on on Monday night. And on that night, after the show was over, they would have to take the set down. They'd have to dismantle it because the school had to use the stage for classes the next day. So it was a pretty fast operation. The rehearsals, a, period, a rehearsal period for one of our plays uh, usually there's about six weeks of rehearsal before we can put the show on. And uh, so they would have to rehearse in the homes. During my uh, early days with the play, a lot of the plays were rehearsed right here in these rooms where we're sitting now. And uh, then they would uh, get on the stage and we'd have to work with the set on uh, well, sometimes we'd get in on Friday night and sometimes not until Saturday, but we'd have uh, two or three nights to rehearse with the set on the stage down there. So that's how, that's how they put the shows on in those days. The group would go on to produce over 80 theatrical performances over the next 24 years. Audience members and critics alike were often stunned by the quality of these productions, marveling that something this good would happen through the efforts of non-professionals. With no stage to call their own, credit for these first-rate performances must be attributed to the passion these individuals had for their art. Ben Rakusin, whose zeal had spearheaded the group, left Oswego in 1942 to fight in the Second World War. The challenge to continue these productions through the war years fell to those who remained. Among that group, there was one whose devotion and sheer talent would distinguish her above all the others.
As any Oswegonian can tell you, this small city that sits on the eastern shore of Lake Ontario is well known for its sunsets, great fishing, and infamously bad weather. Although its harbor had been the subject for numerous works of art for a century, it had never established itself as a haven for visual artists. In late 1959, however, that was about to change. The catalyst for that change, significantly enough, was the weather. One day I decided I wanted to um, take some art lessons. I went to the high school. They were having uh, art classes. Marilyn Shava was the teacher. And um, there were 14 people in the class. But as, a, as the um, time went on and the winter became more severe, people dropped out of the class. And uh, we only had eight in the class and it was required to have 14. So it was disbanded and work we were working on uh, we asked her what we would do with it, and she said, well, I'll critique it in my home if you want to finish it. So uh, that's what we did. And uh, during the winter and spring, Richard Long, who was a, a veteran of World War II, uh, had been uh, rehabilitated by taking art classes uh, at, at the Veterans Hospital to keep himself busy. And um, he asked me if I would, uh, I had mentioned that we should have a local civic group in, in Oswego. <clears throat> and he, he was coming to the office asking, when are we going to start that group, Teresa? When are we going to start that group? And so one day I, I went down to the uh, library and asked Ms. Kersey, if she had any material on how to start a civic art group in our school. And she was really excited about that. She thought that was a great idea. So she looked up some magazines and found that in Maine they were putting uh, their art exhibits on winter fences. They didn't have to have a fancy place to do it. They just liked, liked to exhibit their work, and that's what they used. So she said the best thing to do would be to have a meeting, and, and six people came to the library at this meeting, and they were Richard Long, Mary Lachavo, Ruth Hanks, myself, and uh, I can't think who the other one was, but there were six people. And we uh, decided to put an ad in the paper and advertise for people who were interested in, in starting this group. And we asked permission at the high school if we could use the art room there for this meeting. And the night that we had the meeting, it was snowing very hard. And Ruth Hanks came with one of her paintings covered with a baby blanket. And 16 people showed up at that meeting. We were so happy that uh, so many were interested. And one of the persons who was uh, interested and came with Dave Campbell. He was teaching art at college at that time. And um, he was encouraging us to, to, to continue. And so um, they made me president of the group that very night. The group headed by Teresa Marshall was to be known as the Oswego Art Guild. As with the Oswego players, they had no arts facility of their own. The immediate task before them was to find somewhere to exhibit work and offer classes. Until that could be found, they had to rely on the kindness of strangers, which in 1960 consisted of a month-long members' show held at the Women's City Club and a temporary stay at an empty building on Water Street. Anxious to get on with their mission to support local artists, they decided to try something quite unique. It became a, a real uh, <clears throat> exciting time when um, a few communities somewhere had started to have art shows outdoors and on uh, snow fences and clotheslines in one place or another. And our Juanita Kersey said, well, why can't we have one on the bridge? She organized uh, the bridge show for uh, quite a few years. 
and it became a very popular event and well known and, and we had even state politicians like Nelson Rockefeller visit. It was a, a big event. Hanging that show was tricky. Everything had to had to arrive at the bridge in a big truck in the right order and the truck was allowed to move slowly along while the volunteers took every painting in order and hung it as it went along. We were not allowed to stop traffic. A lot of people came to these bridge shows, people who normally would not think of going to an art center. They were seeing art for a change and they were becoming <laughs> interested and, and uh, uh, people would talk to us. We got a lot of positive reinforcement from doing this. Because of obvious concerns about weather, vandalism, and theft, the bridge show had to be taken down after one day. And although they were popular with the community, they didn't solve the problem of needing a gallery to hang other exhibits. To compound the situation, the group had been asked to vacate their newly refurbished gallery on Water Street after having been in it for only a year. The painting classes they held had to be done in the open air, like the Impressionists a century before. They must have been pretty desperate to attempt what came next. Immediately after the, the refugees left uh, and these apartments were made, um, the place was, was uh, not used and the building we were looking at that was on the riverbank on that side is the building that is the art guild right now, um, they had, scavengers had gone in there and taken all the sinks and all the copper tubing and everything that they could take out of there and there was nothing in there but walls. And I said to Dick, you know, I said, why wouldn't the city let us use that building, you know? I mean, they're not using it for anything. And Dick says, you know, Dick Long said, you know, that's a good idea, Teresa. Let's go over and take a look at it. So Dick Long and um, Dick Bohall, he was a photographer, we all went over and we couldn't get in the, the uh, street level. We had to go through the basement, and, and we had to go down, and it was all water down there, and, um, and we'd get in inside, and, and uh, Dick, who was very astute, I think, with his camera, took pictures of it and found pigeons all over the upper floor and some of the holes in the roof and all that stuff and we didn't think, we didn't know how we'd ever get that place together but Dick kept saying this would be a good place this would be a good place if we fix it up you know and so he went over t to the uh, mayor's office it was Mayor Shapiro I think at that time uh, and uh, asked if we couldn't have that building he said well I you know I I don't know what to tell you. Come to the common council meeting on Tuesday night. And we'll discuss it, you know. So Dick um, asked some of the other people if they'd like to come to this common council meeting on Tuesday. Dave Campbell was our spokesperson that night. But when I went home, uh, after he told me this, Mrs. Saunders, her husband was Alice Saunders, and he was also interested in art. And uh, she was in the uh, theater group, and uh, I knew that. And she wrote plays, and she, uh, I used to stop and talk with her, and she'd be walking her beautiful dog. She had a collie, and every night she'd walk the dog past my house on East 3rd Street. So this one night I knew she'd be coming by, and I said to her, Mrs. Saunders, is your group still looking for a place? I, I know you're meeting in houses because I, I went to Peg Allison, Allison's house and they, they would meet in homes. And she says, yes. I said, well, I'll tell you, we're interested in this building at the fort and it's going to be much too big for our group. But if your group was interested in it, we're going to a common council meeting on Tuesday night. And if your group, any of your group was interested, come Tuesday night. Well, she got on the phone when she got, went home and called uh, uh, Frances Brown, apparently, and people she knew, and they had a bigger representation. 
at the um, council meeting than we did, actually. And, and Frances Brown was really ready for it because she had found out about grants she could get to rehabilitate the building, and she was farther ahead than we were. And there was nothing but a shell when we first went in there. The, uh, the building, as I, as I said, was a ruin. The, the, the windows were broken at that time, and there were pigeons living in there and flying around. And uh, there was usually water in the basement. It would flood all the time, the water would come in. As a matter of fact, uh, in the wintertime, of course, the water, it used, before we moved in there, the water would get in there and it would freeze. And the, the story is, I, I know it's true or not, but there is a story that the kids used to go in there and skate in the wintertime in the basement. The old uh, army buildings, and they had been closed for a long time, so they were a mess. You couldn't just move in there. And that's where the work came, the people were completing that old building where the theater, you know, the Mary and Francis Mary Brown Theater is now. <clears throat> was a I can't imagine what it looked like to start with. The ceilings were falling down and everything was, was well because somebody walked out of there after the army left, locked the door, and that was it. In the fall of 1961, members of the Oswego Players and Art Guild formally petitioned the city government to allow them to use the former quartermaster building of the Ford Ontario complex as a civic arts center. Within a few months, the request was approved and the City Council appropriated $4,000 to begin the renovation project. In the agreement, the City was to cover the cost of the materials. Much of the labor to rehabilitate the structure, however, came from the groups themselves. Most were delighted to finally have the chance. Not surprisingly, many of the women who had been instrumental in the success of these groups were equally anxious to lend a hand. Early on in the process of transforming the derelict building into a functioning arts center, the groups had contacted the New York State Council on the Arts for help. Realizing the project had great potential, NISCA sent representatives to help draw up plans. Assisting them was Perry Reynolds, who had helped design a small community theater in Michigan, and Joe Schoenfeld, a professor of art at Oswego State. The basic plans called for the eastern half of the building to be used as a two-story tall theater and the other half was designed to house a second-story art gallery and one floor of studio space. It was decided that the basement was also to be split in half. In between the two sections was a shared lobby containing lavatories and enough space for a box office and reception area. Initial repairs to the structure were handled by the City Department of Works starting in the fall of 1962. After cleaning debris from the building, installing windows and doors, repairing the roof, and outfitting it with the necessary plumbing, electricity, and heat, the building was turned over to the arts groups in January of 1963. The players and the art guild could now begin work adapting it to their needs. The building, the, the thing, I, you can't understand unless you've been a member of one of these groups, how exciting it is to somebody says, okay, use that building if you want to. And you walk in and you realize that awful as it is, it's yours. And nobody's going to interrupt your rehearsal, and nobody's going to come in and say, sorry, you've got to get out because we've got to do something else. By far, the biggest structural alteration came when the second story floor was taken out of the theater side. This was necessary in order to create a ceiling high enough to accommodate theater lighting. Perry Reynolds, who helped draw up the plans, organized work crews for the players every Thursday night, even advertising their need for helpers in the local newspaper. In spite of this new diversion, the performing arts group managed to produce three plays that year. One of them, Little Mary Sunshine, featured the acting talents of Inez Manor, whose father Norman had been involved with the group since the beginning. Over on the other side of the building, Robert Sandy McWilliams, the Art Guild's second president, was busy organizing a corps of eager volunteers. Because of his position as a professor of industrial arts at the college, Many of these work crews consisted of university students who now had a superb opportunity to develop their carpentry skills. During the first few months, work progressed relatively quickly for both groups, enough that director Fran Brown held rehearsals for the King of Hearts in late January, and the Art Guild managed to celebrate their third anniversary in April, hosting a party in the downstairs studio. By May, they were also ready to present their annual spring show, 
an exhibit that featured 150 works from their rapidly growing membership, which by now was over 150. For a year and a half, the two groups worked diligently to create the Arts Center. By June of 1964, they were ready to present it to the public. And we put it into the theater that it is today. And by that, I mean thousands and thousands of dollars of our money have gone into this building. Um, thousands and thousands of hours of, of you know, people's physical energies to build, to construct, because, as I said, there was nothing here, nothing. It was just an empty, dirty old building. Thank goodness for the, for the fort. They didn't tear it all down all, all the way, because the art guild moved into the other end of that complex where the theater is now, and they used it. And what a marvelous, here's another thing, what a marvelous adaptive use of that building this has been uh, for the benefit of the whole community. Newspaper accounts of the time give the impression that the formal opening of the Civic Arts Center was the cultural event of the decade in Oswego. On ten successive nights, beginning on Thursday, June 4th, and ending on Sunday, June 14th, the two arts groups played host in their new home to hundreds of invited guests. Each evening's festivities included guided tours of the facility, the viewing of several art exhibits, and refreshments. The first three nights, which were by invitation only, featured speeches by local and state dignitaries, as well as the performance of a one-act play called The Minuet. On Sunday, June 7th, the Arts Center was finally opened to the general public and remained that way for one week. The art exhibit hanging in the second floor gallery was stunningly first-rate, consisting of about two dozen works borrowed from museums around the state. Sponsored by the New York State Council on the Arts and curated by Harris Pryor of the Memorial Art Gallery in Rochester, the exhibit featured artwork by some of America's foremost artists of the 19th century including Albert Bierstadt and Winslow Homer. The 20th century was also well represented, boasting works by Charles Birchfield, Reginald Marsh, and Grandma Moses. The relative value of this exhibit was such that special security had to be hired for its two-week stay in the gallery. The downstairs studio displayed artwork by both children and adults that had been created in the art classes offered by the Guild over the past year. Over in the lobby, patrons could view a display of performing arts memorabilia that celebrated Oswego's rich theatrical past. Highlighting the show were old photos, playbills, and posters from the Academy of Music and Richardson Theatre eras. By all accounts, the opening of the Oswego Civic Arts Center was a grand success. On Saturday, June 6th, an editorial appeared in the Palladium Times praising what had been accomplished. At one point, the writer states, but there were some invisible quantities which went into this project too. One was the foresight of its founders, and another was their determination and persistence. Out of the foresight has come a community facility which otherwise would have remained an old building moldering uselessly away. And only those who have had occasion to approach public officials for assistance in such a project can really appreciate how much determination and persistence must have been involved. Uh, as a city official, I really didn't have to do very much. Uh, to, to keep the players functioning, we had to provide a building and, and, and the, public, the public works department um, tried to keep the building that was, that was a functional building. And the players also put a lot of their own efforts into making a building functional. And we paid the cost of utilities, which uh, was a small price to pay for the, for the rewards that, that the players provided to the people who attended those performances. I always thought it was something wonderful and magnanimous of the city to, for years, not charge them any rent, that it came out of the city's budget um, to take care of that. So that was something they were contributing to the community as well. Um, and then recently hearing about that now they're going to pay their heat bill. These things, um, utilities, are extremely expensive. And when you've got a small group um, and then everybody with limited amounts of resources, financial resources, having to now pay for something like that, um, it makes it very, very difficult for them to continue. So there's a lot to be offered here in this, this uh, wonderful, wonderful building that I feel we have saved, we have preserved. I mean, if we hadn't come into this, 
who knows what would have or would not have come in it as i said it was derelict when we got it um, the pigeons enjoyed it um, but that seemed to be all so now it's a vibrant living giving creature when, once we moved into that building of course we could uh, we didn't have to rehearse in the homes anymore we uh, would rehearse right on the stage and they can build their sets early on in the rehearsal period and the people can uh, that are in the show can rehearse right in the area and with the walls and everything where they're supposed to be in the entrances. So they re it's, it's easier for them to rehearse and be right in the... Do the blocking. Yeah, right, in the, do the blocking and everything in there, yes. There's just something about being in this room. There's something um, mysterious, exciting. It really is, it's a, it's a wonderful old building. And if it could talk, if it, if it had a voice, I know it would sing. I really do know it would sing. It would shout. It would... There's a lot of passion in this building from the people that have worked here, either on stage, backstage, building, however you want to look at it. It, it was an exciting time because we were getting ready to finally have this, this wonderful home of our own where we could have our classes and our exhibitions. And, uh, we, we were a, an enthusiastic bunch. And, and we enjoyed doing the work we were doing. There was just a limit to the amount of time we had available. <laughs> well, we all thought it was pretty neat that we were, you know, they were going to have this nice big space suddenly. And uh, uh, I mean, that whole the whole exhibit area was just so neat with the the way the the rafters were and and putting, you know, just the way that the whole thing developed with this the stairs going up and into the uh, into the that that space and and the light and everything was pretty nice. We occupied the building and we fixed it and we put it to good use and we, we really uh, uh, did them a favor <laughs> by uh, making uh, this uh, building that was a shambles into something that uh, was an asset for the city. They were certainly well on their way. The first full-length feature play produced in the new facility was the girls in 509. From there, the players would go on to produce approximately 160 plays in that theater over the next four decades, an average of four a year. By the turn of the millennium, the group's longevity had earned them the distinction of being one of the oldest surviving community theater organizations in the country. Their streak of performing at least one play per year over a 65-year period put them at number two, one spot behind an outfit in New Orleans. 1988 was a watershed year for them. 24 years after the opening of the Civic Arts Center, the players celebrated their 50th anniversary in grand style. To mark the occasion, the community theater group did three things. The first was to reprise the production of the late Christopher Bean, handing over the reins to Fran Brown, the woman who had directed it five decades earlier. The second was to hold a golden anniversary dinner at the Wine Creek Inn, where city officials and representatives from state theater organizations toasted them for their accomplishments. The final step to mark the occasion came as a surprise to Fran Brown, but to no one else. The small theater at the fort now had a name. On Saturday, August 20th, at the conclusion of a performance of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the announcement was made to the sellout crowd. Virginia Reynos, president and longtime member of the players, addressed the delighted audience. I want you to know, dear, that I thank you personally for all that you have taught me and for all the things you did in the starting of this 50 years ago. But I would like you to know, with the unanimous approval of all the players, its members, and the executive committee, that henceforth and hereafter, this theater will be known as the Francis Marion Brown Theater. Uh, she's an amazing woman, um, had an amazing collection of her own, and everyone in town seemed to know her, and she had that wonderful quirk of smoking her cigar. Oswego is a small town, but a friendly one. Well, anyway, I played Rosen for one of the 4th Avenue or 6th Avenue art dealers that came down. I'll never forget 
one night I started to do it with a Yiddish accent and the friend said, don't you dare, don't you ever do that. We will be closed down in a minute. Her personal accomplishments were staggering. Outside of being a charter member of the group and devoting herself fully to the success of the Oswego players for 50 years, several outside organizations had honored her as well. Among these, she was bestowed in 1967 with New York State Community Theater's Mary Eva Duffy Award. And in 1978, she was named Oswego's Woman of the Year. Anyone who knew her would say she was an outstanding teacher, actress, director, administrator, and citizen. Frances Marion Brown passed away in November of 2000 after having lived a very full life, 62 years of which had been given to the Oswego players. In its earliest days, the Oswego Art Guild was comprised mostly of amateur artists of the Sunday Painter variety. By the time work began on the building, a few college professors and professional artists came into the mix. Joe Schoenfeld was one of them. And by the time he was elected the group's third president, it was clear he was an astute visionary and capable spokesman for the newly formed yet rapidly growing organization. It was his leadership that helped them maneuver their way through the construction years. We're equally proud of this far end of the Art Center building, uh, which consists of this art studio, the uh, gallery upstairs, and some future uh, craft studios in the basement. We've had a neighborhood of 200 uh, children uh, go through our classes. Uh, we've had very fine instructors. We've been able to have adult classes both inside and out. So this has become a real working art center. And of course my father being an art professor was very connected to, to the college, but I think he saw Oswego as being a little community that needed to have a little bit more culture kind of thing. At the time, I don't believe Tyler Hall was built, and so there wasn't really much of a gallery in Oswego at all because um, the college gallery hadn't opened yet. And I think he just wanted a place where he could show his stuff and, and lots of other people's stuff too. I remember um, my dad not being around a lot because I think he was pretty busy uh, and uh, probably some conflict between my mom and dad over, uh, you know, spending so much time over at the Art Guild. Unlike Fran Brown, Schoenfeld wasn't able to devote very many years to the group he helped form as he died of a heart attack in 1968, only four years after their grand opening. But what he was able to accomplish in his six years there will not be forgotten. He spearheaded so much of this. He really, uh, he, he was a spark <laughs> to uh, get this whole thing going. And uh, he'd had a lot of experience and, and amateurs such as myself didn't know how to approach any of this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So he gave us a lot of his time and uh, he was a good friend. Despite the loss of such an influential member, a rock solid foundation had been laid for the arts group and they forged ahead. Within a short time, the basement was outfitted with a fully functioning ceramic studio, complete with kick wheels, kilns, and several work tables. Eventually, the guild would decide to add a photography darkroom and printmaking studio on the middle floor, losing some of the classroom space in the process. And to fulfill their original mission of supporting local artists by providing exhibition space, they continued displaying art in their eccentrically beautiful upstairs gallery. Most shows rotated monthly and were usually held only in the spring, summer, and fall to help keep the cost of utilities down. Classes in the downstairs studio, however, would be held year-round. Throughout the 1980s, the group's activities would continue to grow in scope and complexity, even to the point where they were facilitating grants for various cultural organizations. To manage everything, the decision was made to hire full and part-time directors. By the time they were ready to celebrate their silver anniversary, the Art Guild's status as a cultural force in Oswego County was assured. But then, something was about to go terribly wrong. It, it became the director's job to write grants, 
and then the directors were writing grants for themselves more than the group, I think. I, it just lost its focus, I think, when the, we had too many people too deeply into this business of being directors. They were not even necessarily local people who had the same interest that, that the initial group had. And uh, the, the group eventually faltered and, uh, and dissolved. And what happened is, is that it got almost too big. And things started, we began to be mismanaged in some ways. And we, we couldn't put our finger on it exactly, but people, artists weren't getting paid. We had specific grants. I know there was a beautiful mural that was, um, we, I know there was one artist in particular who we never were, able, we were never able to pay them. And um, the board was devastated and alarmed. I, uh, I was a little uh, disappointed as to what happened. More than a little disappointed, really. What happened uh, at the end, we had a president who was in for eight years and she uh, apparently uh, decided that it was to our advantage to have somebody manage it. That's what this Carlos was doing. He was managing it. But he went wayward. You know, he really uh, didn't help us in the end. He, he really brought it to the ground, really. Um, I'm sorry about that. When the director's mismanagement of thousands of dollars was discovered, he was immediately dismissed. The Art Guild's board of directors, leery of any legal ramifications for themselves, made the difficult decision to disband the organization. And in an effort to sweep the matter under the rug as quickly and quietly as possible, no charges were ever filed against him by the Guild. Nearly 30 years after the organization had been born, it was now dead. Needless to say, the arts community in Oswego was devastated and couldn't even imagine that building existing without them. It left a terrible void, but it would not remain for long. Emblematic of the fighting spirit held by the founders of the Guild, a new group would arise nearly a year later. Under the name of the Art Association of Oswego, a simpler, more austere approach was adopted. And what happened is that we no longer paid, had a paid position. It became all, um, after that, it was all volunteer, the organization. So that was a real transition period. Um, everyone there to this day is a, is a volunteer. There are no paid positions. So that was really a turning point for us. I was grateful that a, a new group of people started another organization soon after that. And they have carried on and have been a tremendous asset to the community. One of the key people that during that time really kept things going was Tim McHenry, who became the next um, president of the art, what became then the Art Association. Um, he really, everybody else was kind of tentative and unorganized, but Tim came in and he just had that spirit of let's go, let's just do this. Art's too important, and he, he was a great potter, um, and he really had a passion for the arts and a commitment. In fact, when he, when he died, he, he left us money, and he also left us all his wonderful art books. He just really um, gave his heart to the place. It was too bad. It was a money thing again, uh, when it went under briefly. But look what happened. I went back again, because people really want this. When I got back, I was here only one day when I got a telephone call from the players and one of the women in the players called up and said to me, um, this, uh, she told me she was calling for the players and she said, uh, uh, no, we're casting a play and we're looking for an idiot and we wondered if you were available. 
To those who have never been part of a theatrical production with the players, or any community theater group for that matter, you may not be aware of the complexity and scope of such an endeavor. It may look effortless on the evening of a performance, but much has gone into it in the weeks and months ahead of time to make it appear that way. We work very, very hard on productions. We take six to eight weeks for every production. It's a lot of time for someone to give up an evening and come here. And when we get down toward the end, when it gets time to put on a production, we work more and more hours. We take Saturdays, we take Sundays, we do doubles on Sundays. We do a lot of work, and that takes commitment, which is where I feel the passion comes from. If you don't have that passion, you really shouldn't be involved in, in theater of any kind. It all starts in January of each year, when members who are eligible to direct are invited to make proposals. From there, a play reading committee makes final decisions on the director's submissions. When the shows are chosen and the directors are in place, auditions for the spring production begin in February. Auditions for each show throughout the year are posted in local papers, and membership in the organization is not a prerequisite. They are open to the public. If you want to be in a production, you want to be on stage, you want to act, you want to be backstage a techie, if you want to be involved in a production, you do not have to be a member of the Circle Players. But you do have to have talent. And you have to have some sort of knowledge and a willingness to learn the knowledge that you don't know if you do come in cold off the street. Um, we've never turned anybody away, ever. Yeah, I think people coming off the street have a good chance. It's just got to be the right part at the right time with the right director who wants to teach them. We have to find people with talent that come, and we have to find where their strengths are. Everybody has an equal chance in the productions, whether they've ever been on stage before or whether they're a seasoned performer. Once the director has chosen the cast, six weeks of rehearsals begin in the theater. First thing we do when we have a show cast and we're here is we have what we call a read-through. That's when everybody sits up on the stage, have their script in their hand, and they read the production. They read it through so that they can get that feeling of continuity, of knowing how it ends, and sort of start giving them an idea of what they need to do to, to work on characterization. Then we start rehearsals. We have three rehearsals a week, and they're usually two hours, sometimes two and a half. Um, and we work, the first thing we do once uh, we've read it is start what we refer to as the blocking. This is what the movement, this is where you go from point A to point B and how you get there and on what line you do this. So that takes time. That's one of the things that the stage manager does. He or she sits next to the director and takes all the notes so that if the director says, Francis, you need to cross left, then the stage manager has written Francis X left on such and such a line so that we know, so that we don't have to go over this time and time again, that it starts to sink in immediately. The next step is character development. And you've got to block it. You've got to, you got to get them to start to feel the person. And you've got to get them to feel as a family and as a group and as a unit. Um, and it takes a while. It takes, you know, the first three or four weeks, everybody's like, you know, I'm on book. And they're stumbling when they're blocking because they're reading. And then all of a sudden, it's like they, once they get those books out of their hands, it's a lot easier to direct them. As anyone who has ever acted in live theater can tell you, it is an enormously heavy responsibility to memorize both your lines and the blocking for every scene. It's equally important to gel as an ensemble. So in the weeks leading up to your opening night performance, it's not uncommon for a sense of panic to suddenly set in. If, if you're not panicking, or if you're not worried about the product that you're putting out, or if you're not worried like, oh man, we need to improve this, we need to pick up the pacing, then you're being complacent. And I really love it that we're not together yet. Because a week or two, if you're ready a week or two before the show's ready, your shows aren't, the cast is gonna peak like way too soon. So I like it when people are panicking. Um, I don't like it when my tech crew's panicking, but I want the actors to like say, uh oh, we need to pick this up and we need to pick this up big. So I think, Worrying and panicking the week or two before the shows, I say keep the stress in it because I think it improves the show. Besides working with the actors, the director is also responsible for finding someone to design and build the sets. When you do a set, uh, 
you have to have one des designer, one mastermind. You can't do a set by a committee. And then whatever the whatever the designer, the mastermind, the chief builder, whatever you want to call them, whatever they want done, and if they tell you what they want done, and you go do it, or you help them do what they're doing. Budgets for most shows done by the players is twelve hundred dollars, enough to cover the royalty fees for putting on five to six performances of each play. The players uh, I always admired <clears throat> because they chose a very wide range of plays, very wide range, from the most basic farce uh, to very complicated uh, and very, very difficult plays involving highly dramatic uh, series. For instance, I saw a production here done by the players of Death of a Salesman that was as good as, as any professional company you would see. The way they set it up, um, uh, you're surrounded by the sound, you're surrounded by the players, and, and so you were just enveloped by the, by the, by the story, by the theme, and by, and by the performance. It's, it's just fun. It's, it's a pleasurable place to be. When we did the Fantastics, all of the aisles were used. The audience was involved because we brought them in. We had our, our actors go in and out, weaving in and out. And it makes it more, it makes it more personal, it makes it more fun. It really involves the audience. If, if, there, if there are people in the community who haven't ever gone to the player, uh, they've missed a great, a great night. You can go to the movies for 10 bucks or you can come, or you can come and see your friends and neighbors make the horses asses out of themselves <laughs> for the same price. And I work box office on most of the shows. And I get comments at the end. I never realized what was in this building. I didn't know that I could go upstairs and look at an art exhibit when I'm between half times at the, you know, uh, intermissions. I didn't know that this building has a charm, such charm. I didn't know there was so much talent here. But I do know I'll be back. My definition of art you know, is one where it's, it's creative expression meant for exhibition. And I always tell my classes that when I teach that, you know, art is a, it's a, it's a two-way process. You need a sender and you, you need a receiver. It's a communication. It's a dance. You know, you can't tangle with one person and, and art can't just be involved with just someone sending without having someone to receive. And the people who receive are the viewers at the exhibition. The thing that must be established first and foremost is that an art exhibit is not merely the decoration of empty walls, but an opportunity for a visual artist to communicate to an audience using objects that are typically silent and inanimate. This mysterious interaction lies at the heart of the visual arts and has since the dawn of time. Visual art is both a subtle and powerful language, not just decoration, and as such it is intertwined in countless human experiences. An art gallery is a way for artists and an audience to explore these possibilities. And for four decades now, Oswego has had ample opportunity to do that, thanks to the Civic Arts Center. One of them was Joe Heiss, who did a wonderful job of running the gallery. For 20 years, she uh, saw to it that the gallery had first-class shows. It was wonderful. I mean, I started making, uh, doing the first exhibit in for the opening and that was for theater and I got so interested in it the Richard Bates house had an awful lot of old photographs and nobody ever looked at that stuff that was before it became a museum mm. so I went there and did some research and put up the exhibit aside from being a very hard worker with a keen eye for talent Joe Heiss's connections with SUNY Oswego's art department helped to create many first-rate exhibits for the Art Guild. So did her frequent trips to New York City. Well, I went to Fifth Avenue and it was the French Cultural Services and asked them what they could do for me when I was in New York. And it's not very far from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And 
they said, they, they might do something for me. I should write to them what I'm doing, what we're doing here in Oswego. And, we, and I got wonderful exhibits from them. We all worked for free. Right. I did not get ever one penny. As a matter of fact, I put a lot of time in it. But we had a lot of fun, and I, I thought, being an, a newcomer from, I came from New York City, and before from Germany, uh, this was one thing, to, to do something for the small town here, for the city. And of course, we have been going on for many years. Ever since the Art Association was formed in 1990, they have attempted to continue the tradition established by the Guild of offering first-rate art shows to the public. One show in particular, held in the spring of 2002, is very special to the Civic Arts Center's long history. It was called Art and War and featured artwork done by children and adults inside concentration camps during the Holocaust. Organized in conjunction with performances of the Children's Operetta Bundabar, and displayed with assistance from members in the Oswego Opera Theater, the exhibit was as prestigious and memorable as any held within these walls. The display consisted of over 100 images collected by Holocaust survivor Walter Greenberg, who was able to photograph them after the war. Greenberg, ironically enough, was in Oswego 57 years earlier, living as a refugee at the Safe Haven Encampment at Fort Ontario. To help set the appropriate tone for the rather somber opening, music was performed by vocal ensemble Consinity. The emotional impact on those who viewed the exhibit may never be known. Nevertheless, the show gave the Art Association a golden opportunity to fulfill its mission of providing the residents of Oswego with quality educational and aesthetic experiences. Another show dear to members' hearts happened a year later. Thank you very much, everybody. Come it was called Honoring the Past, the First Years in the Gallery, and was intended to honor those who had been involved with the Oswego Art Guild during its first decade of existence. The main exhibit consisted of 67 works by 37 former members, and was dedicated to Joe Heiss, who had held the post of exhibition coordinator for 22 years. In the downstairs gallery, there was a display of 30 paintings by Bert Layton. In this instance, the Art Association felt it would be appropriate to honor the only person who has had a continuous membership in both organizations, a span of 43 years. But it's a really active environment. An opening usually lasts two hours or so, but there's active conversation about the work. That's the time to meet the artists. That's the time, you know, to bounce reactions off other people. You know, how do they feel about a certain piece of artwork? Uh, that's the time if you're going to buy a piece of artwork. That's the important time to do it because if you come back the next time, you never know if it might already be sold. For the past 40 years, the thing that has perhaps been the most consistent feature exhibition-wise is the annual members show. Whether or not it has adopted a juried or open approach, members have always been given the chance to display the work they've created. Considering how difficult it is for artists to find adequate facilities to exhibit their work, this yearly invitation is perhaps the art group's surest calling card. The gallery space here, I mean, you can see some of it in the shot, uh, it's a beautiful space and it's really, it's really versatile. Um, I'm just in love with the space and I really enjoy uh, the challenge of taking different work and trying to put it in the space and make it fit and make it work and every time having a little bit different group of work and a different look to the gallery when the show is finished. Um, but that's an exciting thing. Um, a lot of times uh, a group of people will get together and come up and try to hang the show and try to decide you know, what looks best next to what. And, and, it just always seems eventually to fall in place. Something always happens at the last minute so that all the works have a best spot and it's really exciting. But I can also remember being able to run up the stairs and check out the, the exhibit room when uh, they were getting ready to hang shows and stuff um, and then getting to go to an opening once in a while. It's rustic. Uh, it's, it's kind of ha it has that New York City loft appeal to it, you know. It has the high rafters and 
Um, and, and the whole design of the gallery, these, these beams that are angled, kind of reminds you of the, it seems like that you're in this really important um, space. It's kind of ship-like and cathedral-like at the same time for me. I was very, very impressed with the gallery itself. Uh, for a small community, I thought it was a very aesthetically pleasing gallery. Yeah, also, it is it's very important that if somebody comes, moves into Oswego, you can show them that we have an art center, not only Tyler Hall, that the city is interested in art and also in theater. In their early days, the Oswego players counted many teachers in their ranks. So it isn't surprising that the group has had as keen an interest in theater education as they did in theater production. This commitment to learning stagecraft and passing it on to others eventually earned them an absolute charter from the Education Department of the State University of New York, granted in 1969. This commitment to education continues today. They could use that word permission to show everyone. Um, it's not just something we do in the evening because we have nothing better to do. That these people um, believed in what they were doing, enjoyed what they were doing, and enjoyed presenting this to uh, a public that seemed pretty receptive to them. We have the high schools in here, the Oswego High School, APW High School, Fulton High School, and now I've added Pulaski. The building resonates with the sound of these kids. The Oswego players' contributions to theater education can also be found through the extraordinary efforts of longtime members Wayne and Kelly Mosher, whose creation of the Oswego Children's Theater in 1999 has given hundreds of Oswego County youth opportunities in this field. Each production they've undertaken since then has been a family affair, so to speak, relying heavily upon the talents and hard work of the four Mosher children. Much of the credit for inspiring mom and dad to start this sister organization goes to Lindsay, the oldest girl. Her involvement in theater education and several plays in Syracuse led them to sense a need to start something for children in Oswego. Lindsay yeah. is a, a gifted children's director. Yes. She, uh, I mean, they're scared of me because I'm the big guy that yells, but she, she, not only, the big Mr. She, she not only knows what she's doing, but she doesn't have to yell. She uh, controls the kids by just raising her hand. She boggles our mind, and we've seen her do it now. You know, we've watched her grow and learn, and, and as she matures and whatnot. I mean, to take 153 kids at 20 years old, put them on stage, basically, boom, there you are, you know, in a period of about 10 weeks, you know, that's an amazing undertaking. No one does that. When I call for the royalties for shows and I say, I'm looking for something huge. I say, well, how huge? And I said, well, last year I put on, I put 153 kids on a stage and they said, nobody does that. Said, well, but we did, so what have you got that's big, you know? <laughs> Perhaps the most impressive aspect of these immense productions is the costume. Calling upon a deep reservoir of artistic vision and utilizing the talents of a team of volunteers, Kelly creates all the characters' costumes from scratch. We're becoming fairly known for our costume, our creativity, our... I don't sleep much because I think about, you know, what I can do um, to make the costumes bright and exciting and eventually I will have a vision. I've got the material. I had the vision for the material so I have all the material but actually putting that material into the right costume will probably take me another month or so until it all comes to me. It's, it's, it's a pretty heavy duty process. The size of the productions the Mosiers choose to do is both the organization's biggest asset and their greatest challenge. Well, after we'd done uh, children's theater for a while, it, uh, the players, one of our problems was it was a hard place to do a large production. 
um, and we wanted to involve as many kids as possible. We decided that if we really wanted to do a large production, it would be very crowded at players because it's a beautiful, beautiful little theater, but it is very small. Despite the cramped quarters, the OCT's 2002 production of Babes in Toyland was successful enough that they are scheduled to make the Bluebird in December of 2003, again at the Francis Marion Brown Theater. One recent performance done by the fledgling theater troupe that was not done on an epic scale was Juvie. And we felt that one of the things that we could give back to the community was the idea that theater can be used as an educational tool. Um, so we chose a play written by Jerome McDonough um, about 13 juvenile delinquents who they discuss what they did, why they did it, um, and the consequences for their actions. Sometimes the adolescents aren't aware of the actual consequences that go along with some of those things. So we took that, we did two free performances um, at the Issue of the Players. It's part of uh, getting our name out too. We want to be recognized as a service organization, not just an organization that puts on a show every year. Right. And it, we're really aiming for it to be a year-round organization and use different kids for different sorts of things, you know. Outside of the creation of several performances each year, the Mosher's involvement with education also takes the form of theater workshops. We did um, a series of three what we call theater fun days and they were broken down into three age groups and there were different activities for different age levels. Um, she taught theater games and techniques and depending on the age group she, you know, did different levels of um, just fun but training exercises I guess is what you would call them. So more and more we're being asked to do them. Um, it's a fun hour or two, you know, um, and again, it just allows them to see what theater is, what different things theater can, can bring to them, and bringing theater to kids who may not be exposed to actually going to a theater, it just kind of opens their eyes, you know, there is theater there. And these children are on stage. They're not out doing drugs. They're not smoking. They're not doing things that they shouldn't be doing. They're doing creative things. And when a student, when a young person, and we have little, little ones that work in our shows, when they do these things, it's good for coordination. It's good for memorization. There's a lot of things. There's a lot of pluses. And if you get to be my age and you're still doing theater, it's the same thing. It's good for the brain cells. There's an awful lot of pluses to being involved in the theater. As a child, I took um, I took art classes from children's art classes from Zabel Zarian. It was fun. It was fun to be able to do those kind of things, and it was a little different than going to art class in in, in school. Unfortunately, I wasn't quite as talented as my dad. Never <laughs> never managed to be a, be a, as you know as good as he was. I, it was still a very enjoyable, and I really liked having the opportunity to to, to do those kind of things and to play around with with different mediums and, and things. So I guess I'm pretty connected and, and think that it's a pretty neat place and something that we ought to have in this community to keep and uh, I would sure hate to see anything happen to it. By late November of 1959, the snowfall that fell in Oswego was already considerable. So much so that a painting class held at the high school had to be canceled due to low turnout. Frustrated not only by the bad weather but more so by the lack of autonomy over their educational goals. A small group of artists began dreaming of their own art center. And the rest is history. But since the very beginning, it has always been about learning. Whether through classes that were offered covering every medium imaginable, to the occasional lecture or demonstration by a local expert, or the more subconscious enlightenment that occurs when viewing an exhibit, the Arts Center has a proven track record as an educational institution. A number of people who have walked through the doors of the Civic Arts Center bent on improving themselves, and in some cases amusing themselves, is simply uncountable. 
a lot of our um, exhibitions have an educational component to them, so I think that you know the more people we can get through here, the more service we're doing to the community, and not just fulfilling our education mission or our exhibition mission, but also the education. As a prime example of this educational emphasis, teacher Billy Joe Peterson had her classes view the 2002 members exhibit hanging in the upstairs gallery. After spending several minutes looking at the work, the students were asked to select their favorite piece and then explain their choice. It's weird. You like the beach, and you like the waves, and you think it's creative. You like all the different... Household items. Oh, yeah. Found objects. The very next month, the students became the teachers by exhibiting the work they had made that summer. The downstairs display provided the Art Association with an excellent opportunity to show the public what they could offer youngsters during the summer months. I think especially in the summer because we have a lot of sports programs going on and you know sports is great. I played them all my whole life and it's still in playing. And but I think it's good to have at least one alternative to that, um, right? Fine art, you know, is a great thing. I just think it's important for those kids that might not enjoy sports as much or want to try something new and different, they can do that. Ceramics is very popular, um, and I think if I was to guess why, it would be because um, it's very hands-on, first of all, and not all of the kids get a whole lot of exposure to working with ceramics. They may get one project a year, which is not a lot of time, so they, <clears throat> they can have you know, a couple straight weeks of ceramics, you know, working two or three days a week if they take a class here, uh, which is, it just gives them more hands-on time and I think they really enjoy it. Perhaps the biggest reason why ceramics classes are in such high demand is due to the fact that firing kilns are necessary for the creation of clay-based art. And since these are not common household items, public access is severely limited in this medium. It isn't only children who have benefited from art classes at the Civic Arts Center over the past four decades. Hundreds, if not thousands, of adults have made the trek over to the Fort Complex and taken advantage of quality instruction there. Sometimes, even in bad weather, we had classes right through the winter. Uh, sometimes it was it was tough, <laughs> you know, shoveling your way in. And then one time, uh, I had to actually thaw the the doorknob with my hands in order to get the key in, into it because it was covered with ice. Uh, and, but we carried on. Instructors for these classes have usually been professors from the college or area public school art teachers. But since this isn't a requirement, any artist who has an interest in teaching may do so. Most art media have been taught in these studios at one time or another, and the class fees are purposely kept low to ensure accessibility to all community members. Class sizes are typically in the range of four to eight people, allowing for lots of individual attention and a low-key atmosphere. This intimacy is likely responsible for the natural camaraderie that often develops among artists. Yeah, well, that was really great to be able to, to gather there weekly with a group of interesting people. And we became good friends, obviously. But it's, it means to me, and I gather to others, it means a great deal not to have to work in isolation. And I've always kind of attributed that to my insecurity and my inexperience uh, that I needed to have other people around who were doing the same kind of thing. But I think other people feel that way too. There's a terrific nourishment that accrues when you're working with, beside, and talking to other artists and looking at their work and they're looking at yours. And it's, it's, a, it's a great thing. Those were very happy days.
A common frustration voiced by members of the Players and Art Association is that in spite of its four decades of existence, the Oswego Civic Arts Center's presence in the city is still somewhat of a mystery to many in the community. Getting people to walk through their doors remains one of their primary objectives. Outside of the usual publicity that goes into advertising their shows, the players' commitment to dinner theater has proven to be an effective way of getting the word out. And I think there's uh, a few people that came to the dinner shows and realized, hey, wait a minute, Oswego has a, a theater group that has something to offer and that will now go to the shows at the theater. Um, I think it's just a matter of getting the word out there that, that, that Oswego does have, you know, an organization like this. Once we've got them in there and they say, hey, wait a minute, these people are pretty good and, and this was a great time, you know, let's go see something else that they've done. During the 2003 season, there were two highly successful dinner theater productions put on by the players. One was Laura, a play they've done several times in their history, and the other was Social Security. In both instances, they were held at the Elks Lodge, where manager Eric Kronk could deftly handle his dual roles as host and stage manager. It's a great feeling when, when, you're, um, when the show is actually going on. Uh, I, uh, I like being involved, I like going up and, and talking to the people and getting their reaction, and plus the fact that I know most of them, you know, I'm joking around with them, kidding with them, and, and laughing with them. Um, and then, you know, I gotta run in the kitchen, make sure everything's going smooth back there. Um, and then also being able to go backstage and make sure everything's going smooth back there because the cast and the crew, I mean, they're the ones that are putting all their time and energy into this and, you know, to make sure that they're happy and comfortable and just to let them know that we appreciate, you know, all the time and energy they've put into to creating this. In the winter time over there, a lot of people are um, sort of afraid to go to the to the theater in the winter time over there because of the weather. Although uh, there really isn't much reason for fear to go over there. I mean, usually you can get in and get out of there, but people have that feeling. And we so we did for a while. We did uh, dinner theater, and we do it out in restaurants, and we could do. Um, a play in the winter time and do it two blocks down the street at one of the restaurants there and uh, pack the house but if we tried to do the same thing up in the theater we wouldn't get a crowd because people were afraid they're going to get stuck in the snow up there but they, they weren't afraid of getting stuck downtown I don't know. <laughs> with an equal zeal to get the word out the art association recently began a program to obtain grant money for the purpose of offering art classes to the outlying communities and to those who may have had difficulty getting to the fort. This highly successful program is called Art For Me and has been coordinated by AAO board member Karen Ringwald since 2001. We wanted to provide an outreach program for the community of Oswego County. Because the membership of the Art Association has a lot of teachers, uh, also a lot of artists who do want to um, do some teaching. And if we could get the money, which we did, through the grant for the Art For Me program, we're able to pay for teachers and supply the materials. We also considered the fact that the uh, folks from the nursing homes would not be able to come to the Art Association for classes. That if, if they were to get these kinds of classes, that we would have to go to them. And um, as part of a, a program of uh, wanting the community to know that we are here and reaching out to the community to let them know uh, that we can provide uh, cultural experiences and artistic experiences uh, to the community in general, we felt that this would be a very good way of doing that. We're also including people from the community and some uh, students, so we're trying to get uh, some multi-age and uh, diversity of the participants involved. For the past three years, the Art For Me program has held over a dozen free workshops and courses at various locations throughout Oswego County, including one at the BOCES campus in Mexico in 2003.
It was here that an outreach was created for the purpose of serving the migrant population of the area. In addition to gaining experience with clay, participants also had a chance to try their hand at printmaking at one station and tissue paper craft at another. At still another location, children and their parents could hear animal stories read by a local author. With this dual emphasis on education and outreach in this grant-funded program, the Art Association of Oswego once again demonstrates its mission to improve their community one artistic experience at a time. And so this is just another way to bring art out to the community rather than just waiting for the community to come to us. Art, if it is a part of a community, changes your life in subtle ways that you don't even know it. And that is where I think people benefit. The arts are a part of who we are. It gives people an opportunity to express themselves, to take critical thought to points where we may not have gone before. And I think those are very important and critical for us to be supporting the arts. I think it's very short-sighted of politicians not to recognize the asset of the arts. I think they think about jobs, I think they think about services, but services such as um, sewer, cleaning streets, etc., etc. I don't think they think of service in terms of the arts. And if the arts are a service too, they're a service to the spirit. <laughs> they're a service to the better parts of us, the um, creative, the, the parts that are the dreaming parts, I think. Uh, the quality of life of a community depends on so many pieces. and arts fit into that, I think, at a higher level than many other things do. And I think as people settle today, they're looking for those places who are active and vibrant and who are firing on all cylinders. They don't realize how much the theater and the arts, the other arts, the dance, all the rest of it, adds to life. If you have a culture without those things, you have no culture. Going back to the Greeks again, they, not only are they remembered for the plays and the poetry, but it shaped a democratic society. Any city is better off with uh, cultural organizations because it gives people an outlet, people who are interested in it. If they didn't have this, what would they? They would have nothing. I hope the time is, uh, is coming soon when the city will be able to repay uh, the art group and, and their members and former members for what they've done for the city. They're really an asset to a community. They are doers. They do the things that, that make a community more than just houses and people. They, are, they make a community an educational experience, a rewarding artistic experience, just a pleasurable experience and, and they're the kind of people that make a community what it is. You know, we've got something in the city that um, a lot of other cities this size might not have or you know might not do as well i mean the players have been around for so long um, it's just amazing the number of shows that you know players have put on over the years and um, that they're still going still going strong we've had several other people too they're, they've been very important to us uh Dona Toronto, city radius then down the can something very strong to keep, it, to keep it all together. In, in today's world, in all the ugliness, it's some place to go to be safe. It's some place to go and laugh, to sit with your neighbor, your friend, your husband, your wife, your child, to be in a dark area and see light and brilliance, to see joy, to see sorrow. It's a lovely way to spend an evening or an afternoon. And I love this place because every time I'm feeling sad, I walk into those doors and a smile comes across my face. About three years ago, something happened where I said I need 
I needed to get find my smile again. And when I walked through those doors and did a show, my smile came back. To this day, I think that's that's what still exists now, is a lot of people putting in extra time, and, and you're not going to get paid for it in money. But if you love what you do, and you love sharing it with, with co the community, then it's, then it's worth it. It's just amazing what some of these people will do for no pay, you know, just because they enjoy it, because, you know, they're, they're just such great people, you know, they're willing to give up of their time, their energy, um, just to do something fun like that. It was something that the community decided they needed, and people were willing to roll up their sleeves and have things happen. It's the, uh, the notion of being able to say, we can do it, and then do it. I know I grew up in a town that didn't have a gallery, and it seemed really unusual. When I came here and I saw the activity, back then it was the art field, but the amount of activity that went on between the college galleries and here is very exciting. This community has many things going for it, uh, particularly in the area of uh, youthful athletics, uh, uh, tourism activities, but none of those uh, eclipses the players for the quality of life activities that they, pre that they present. But from a business perspective, as we look at bringing people into this community, into the Central New York region, we have to look at all of those aspects. And if we're funding one at the detriment of another, I think we're hurting ourselves in the long run. So I think the arts are as important or maybe more important than any of those other components that add to the quality of life. How can you send your message out if there's no place to hang out working in your local community? And how can the community learn how to appreciate art if there's no close, convenient, accessible, affordable venue, you know, for them to come see it? And acting is a totally creative process. So the more, more your mind creates, the uh, uh, better you get along in life to a certain extent. Also, if you can get up in front of 300 people and you know, dress up like a fairy or something like that, you can probably do anything. <laughs>